those of you who don't know me, I'm, I'm Jules White. I think most of you have met me somehow either online, on LinkedIn, at conference speaking, or maybe just in our networking that we do generally uh, with some women network groups that I'm in and my own sales hub Facebook group. So it's lovely to see you. It really is. And the opportunity to take you through just some really cool things around the discovery call, as we call it. So the first thing I'm going to ask you is I'm going to ask you to put some uh, A's, B's or C's into the chat. I'm going to ask you a couple of questions so that we can really gauge who's in the group and how you're feeling, because that's really useful for me to look at afterwards as well for future content. So how are you feeling about the following? I'm going to ask you these questions. You would love to feel more confident on discovery calls, but, and you can be all three, by the way, are you A, you don't really know what to say on them? Are you B, you don't feel in control of the call? Or are you C, you never end up with A, what happens next after a discovery call? So if you pop in the chat, whether you're an A, B, C, or all three, I can start seeing those coming through. And there's a few C's in there. That doesn't surprise me at all. Wonderful. Thank you, that's brilliant. Okay, the second question. You worry about objections because A, you hate confrontation. I guess actually a lot of us do. B, they may not want to pay your prices, or C, they may have quotes from your competitors. Which one is most relevant to you? I like that. I'm okay with that. I love that person that put that, that's awesome. Lovely, that's great. A few Bs in there as well. And then the last question is the end of the discovery call is the worst because A, you never know how to finish the call, B, you hate quoting prices, or C, you don't feel comfortable asking for the sale. Which one, if any, is the most relevant for you? Again, a real mix in there. That's really, really helpful. C, but all three. <laughs> Lovely. Eleanor's put, I can't get off the call quick enough. <laughs> I should have put that as, as D, shouldn't I, as the option for D. Okay, so, um, and just finally in the chat, please, what do you really want to get from the session? If there's something specific that you felt was going to be really useful to know by joining my webinar, I'd love to know what it was. So please do pop it into the chat. And that's, again, helpful for me. If for any reason I don't answer it on this webinar, I have the chat to be able to come back to you and potentially help you out, which is always good. So lots of things coming in, a better way to finish the call, more confidence on the call. I'm gonna open the chat up just quickly and see what else is coming in. Keeping the call on track and not having it turn into a consultation. That, that's a really good one, Sarah. I think we're often really prone to helping so much on a call that we've almost done the paid work on the call. I am totally familiar with that. Turning an inquiry into a lead, confidence. <laughs> Sarah, I hear you, Kirsten says. Nailing the outcomes, benefits that they would get, but being very focused with it, not waffly. <laughs> You're never waffly, Sarah, I'm sure. Okay, that's really great. Thank you so much for that. That means you're completely now inclusive in this session because I now know what you're looking for. Let's have a look what Nikki says. That looks interesting. Hopefully confirmation that I can do it and confidence to keep trying. You absolutely can do it. Absolutely can, lovely. All right, let's start then. So there were three key things that I want to deliver in the webinar tonight because as much as I'd like to deliver you a hundred things, I have to just try and make it really, um, give it some clarity, I think. So I looked at how to effectively handle discovery calls with calm, confidence and ease, because I'm very aware that fear is often a big part of our failings, if you like, on a discovery call. And failings not meaning that you're all going to fail ever, but we always think we're going to fail. It's that mindset piece again. 
The second thing is how to turn objections into powerful attraction points, because I think this is a really, really good piece in a discovery call, which I hope is going to help you no end. Then how to beautifully close the call, because any of you who know me, I hate the word close, because I always think actually it's the start of something when you make a sale but continue the conversation. Okay, so actually I think closing a discovery call is absolutely about being able to and position to continue the conversation with that person. So there's the three things we're gonna to cover tonight. And I'm going to help you think differently. That's always my goal in my webinars. So hello and welcome. You're ready to work with the real Dragon Slayer. Some of you do know my live it, love it, sell it methodology. Um, and obviously one of my big pieces of history is that I was in the Dragon's Den. So I've learned a lot in 30 years selling and discovery calls is probably something I've done a huge amount of. So I want to now share some of that gold with you tonight. So let's start with the first one, how to effectively handle discovery calls with calm, confidence and ease. So there's a few different ways that we have these discovery calls. Um, sometimes we actually have them on the phone, would you believe? I mean, that is probably quite old school, but some people do still have their discovery conversations over a phone, which means you're not really seeing anybody. You're just over with audio. Zoom's been the very common one, which you'll all be familiar with. We are all Zoomed out, I suspect, and so I'm thrilled you're here tonight. But an ideal discovery call is obviously face to face. So you will recognize potentially which one of those you're doing in the most often time. I like to think of a discovery call as like having a cup of coffee with a friend. And the reason I position this is because sales is hugely about psychology, mindset and how we feel. So if we go into a discovery call thinking I need to make a sale, suddenly the fear starts to bubble up before we've even started. So if you start thinking about this as having a cup of coffee with a new friend or even an existing customer, if they are, and you're, you're going to talk to them about something else that you'd like to sell to them, then I think this is a great place to start. So it just starts to strip back all those fears around the call. Before you even decide to have a discovery call, there's a big piece of advice in that it's great to qualify the call. So actually, make sure that you know the reason why you're going to take time to have that call. Now, for some of you, it will be a dead cert that you're going to be providing a service on that call. But for a lot of us who are providing a service-based product, we get asked to have virtual cuppers and Zoom calls quite regularly. And what we really need to do is decide whether that call is a potential customer who's serious about buying something from us or whether it's going to just be a general chat. And there's nothing wrong with the general chat, by the way, because they can still lead to sales. But I think when you can gain confidence in having a discovery call, it's coming from a place of knowing exactly what that call outcome is going to be. So qualify the call and get as, as clear as you can why you're going on a call with that person. And that's just through a general conversation. It might be that they've already said, I really want to find out more about your services. And you could say to them anything specific, they might say, well, let's have a chat. So you always have that starting point, but qualifying it as much as you can is a really big tip. And that means you're not gonna be on a lot of calls for no reason. The second thing that we don't often do, and some of us might, but actually is planning our call. And I think planning a call allows you to, as Sarah says, although I don't think she does do this, it cuts out some of the waffly stuff when you've got a really clear vision of what you want to do with that call. So today I'm going to be giving you a slight, um, I suppose, an insight into structure as well, which will be really helpful. And then you could take that and start saying, right, well, here's the things I want to do in that call. And here's the order I want to do them in. And that creates a structure and a plan for your call. And then one of the most important things is understanding the outcome that you want from that call, all right? Now, it's not just your outcome, it's also the customer and client's outcome. But initially, you need to understand, actually, what's my expectation for me for having this discovery call? And just to make it quite 
helpful, I guess, is there's, there's a few things here and a few reasons or outcomes, if you like, that I think you can get from having a discovery call. The first one is a, quite a, um, a big picture type of level where you may have a call with somebody because you want them to understand what you do in order to refer you. And those calls happen. And that is still a discovery call because it's a, a longer journey of selling, but it's about a networking type of discovery call. So that could be your outcome. I'm going to meet with this person because I'm pretty sure they've got a great network. I'd like to tell them more about what they do. Equally, you can find out what they do too and pass them back into your network. So there's that type of discovery call. It could be that you are actually in a sales discovery call, but the outcome will be not a sale and not even a proposal because that client is not quite ready. But it could be that you can connect them with an existing client of yours. And that's like a referral testimonial type connection. And that outcome is a really good outcome to get from a discovery call. So remember that one in your, in your pocket because it's a really good one to have. It's almost a stage one of a discovery call. And when we go on to talk about the other things tonight, you'll understand how this all connects together. An ideal outcome is that you send a proposal of some sort in order for them to really see that you've listened to them and understood them and here's what you can offer as a service. That also puts something in writing, which I always think is good because it gives me time to digest it, look it over, and then it's more official because it's actually there in writing in front of me. And the final one is that you make the sale on the call. And you might feel like that's really scary, but it actually happens. I have had people at the end of a discovery call say to me, so how do I work with you and when do we start? So it can happen. So there's lots of different outcomes, but there's just a couple there for you to think about when you're making your plan. And what do you need to know to get the outcome that's right for both you and your client? So that's part of your plan. And that really is starting to look at the questions that you might want to ask. And we are going to talk about that as well tonight. The big thing that I always say to all of my clients and every talk that I do is to step into the world of your customer or your patient or your buyer. However you refer to that person that you want to connect with, you have to step into their world. Because often in sales calls in discovery calls, we have seen salespeople sell us what they think we want to buy. And that usually makes us feel a little bit unheard, a little bit yucky, and we don't connect. But when you really start to immerse yourself in that person's world, you can really start to understand what makes them tick, what they think value looks like, and how you're then going to make that connection through the discovery call. So stepping into the world of your buyer, the other person who is on that call with you, is going to be so critical for you to build your confidence in then how you continue that conversation. This statistic, um, I think if you were in my workshop, guys, from the conference on Monday, I used this in that workshop, but 70% of buyers have already fully defined their needs before they talk to us as their salespeople. And that's good old Google for you right there. And actually 44% have specifically identified it. And the reason this step comes out again and again for me is I want people to realize that your buyer, your customer, your patient has actually already decided in their mind pretty much what they want to do. And it's then your job in a discovery call to find that out, but equally make sure they haven't missed something because we all know that Google just spiders a whole load of content that's out in the World Wide Web. It's not an expert on anything which is why if you look carefully, you'll get conflicting advice from Google. But the point being is you are the expert in what you do. So when you do get the conversation with that person, they're very likely to have done some research. So ask them, ask them what they're expecting, ask them what they found when they've looked into what their problem was, what solutions they like, ask those questions because then you start to get a feel for exactly how much research or not that they've done. 
into what they want from you and what they expect from you. And I like this quote because this is from 19, well, Margaret Mead was born in 1901. So already that was way, way back that we understood that the human species and it's in order for them to evolve, evolve, the conversation must deepen. So already they knew that. And actually they were so good at it because they were, well, they had conversation as their main point of contact. We've become very bad at conversation because of technology, because of internet, because of being able to connect so easily, but we are the best at conversation. And conversation is the one big thing that will create the most amazing discovery calls. So I just wanna make sure that we're really looking at our natural life skills that we have to use in our discovery calls, a bit like you would if you were having coffee with a friend. Hence the reason I position it at the beginning like that. So when you're planning your call, Here's a few things that you can think about. And by the way, I'm very happy to let you have a copy of the slides after this. So don't worry about that. And this is also recorded. Initially, you should be establishing the needs. That's like the qualification of that call before you even have the call. So thinking about what you already know your customer might want from you, understanding why they want the call with you. Also, what outcome do you want from that call? What questions do you want to ask, which we're going to look at in a minute? And what solution do you suspect you can offer? And I use the word suspect because I don't want you to decide on a solution before you've had the discovery call. But you might have had an initial conversation where you think, well, actually, I'm pretty sure that's going to be a workshop. I'm pretty sure that actually I could say, read my book. You know, so you've almost got a couple of three solutions ready that you think may suit that call. How will you make that offer? So think about, are you gonna be looking at sending a proposal? Do you want to perhaps send them off to another existing client so that they get some clarification and give them some space and time? And then what will the next steps be? So how soon would you follow up on that call? What do you want to set as expectations within that call? These are the things that we often don't plan and we often don't then get in the call. That's why we have fear when we're having discovery calls. And that's the other reason why we want to get off the call as soon as possible. <laughs> because we haven't got that structure and plan in our minds to give us the confidence. And it's like anything in life. When we've done this, we've planned it and we've done it a few times, we just get more confident about how we do it. If we're already confident at having discovery calls and conversations, you might actually see something that you don't do that you can then add in and, and do instead and, and as well. So this hopefully will all will help every level that is on the call today who are doing calls with their customers. And this stat's also important, I think, because 65.2%, that's very specific, I know, but 65.2% of buyers said that they found value in discussing their situations with salespeople. And I think we often have a fear that people don't want to be sold to. But I think what it really is, is they want to be helped and they want expert advice, but they definitely don't want to be pushy and sleazy sold to which we all know how that feels. So don't rule yourself out because actually you're the expert, you know what you're talking about and you are the one who can help them. So they want your help. And I know I do when I go to buy something, I actually want somebody to help me and I want to ask them questions. So yet again, I say step into the shoes of the buyer because you're also a buyer. So think about how you buy and what you want to know. So the first part of our webinar, which was how to effectively handle your discovery calls with calm, confidence and ease is set out for you. And ultimately it is about planning so that you've got a structure and you know exactly what you want to do within that call. That should also stop any waffling, Sarah, not that you do it. I'm gonna keep saying that bit after it because I'm sure you don't. But when you're perceived you know, yourself, if you think, oh gosh, all I do is waffle, that kills your confidence straight away. 
So the second part is how to turn objections into powerful attraction points. Okay, so when uh, I was selling, I was trained to sell many, 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 many times. And I've told a lot of you when I've spoken to you that I did not like how I was trained. And one of the really big modules that they always focused on was objection handling. And it always felt very interesting to me that we were training salespeople how to handle objections. But what we weren't doing was training salespeople how to stop objections even happening. So I like to approach it in a slightly different way. That doesn't mean to say we will never get objections about anything. But I truly believe that you can stop objections happening if you nurture a discovery call in the right way. So the first thing is stop them before they start. Because really what we need to think about here is why do objections actually happen? Um, any of you got any ideas, just to include you a little bit in the chat, um, why do you think people have objections during a sales process or a discovery call? What are your thoughts on the subject? Let's see what comes out here. They don't know the value. Calls have not been agreed first, so they're taken by surprise. That's really interesting. They don't trust you. A defense mechanism. They're looking for reassurance. Their perceived value versus real value and, or monetary value. Feeling pushed into something too quick. Wonderful. And right there is exactly why you get objections, every single one of those. So the big things that stand out for me are things like value. The other thing that stands out is feeling pushed into something, which means you haven't really had a two-way conversation, let's face it. If you're starting to feel like you're being pushed into something, I think the other part of that is you don't always feel heard. You don't feel like anyone's been listening to you or understands what you really, really want. Um, looking for reassurance is a really good one. So this is that empathy piece. And that's often missing when we're doing structured, scripted sales process with people. Um, and never need to build rapport, Nikki. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for those guys. They are wonderful ones to consider. So we kind of know why we get the objections. And I suspect that some of those have probably come from how you felt when you wanted to make an objection during a sales call. So let's have a look at what else we have to tell you. Well, George Bernard Shaw, of course, he said that the, big, the single biggest problem in communication is the illusion that it's taken place. And I love this and I do use it regularly because we often think we have communicated. Well, I did tell you that. Well, I did ask you that. But what you might have done, not you personally guys, of course, you might have been asked the question, but did the answer the, actually get listened to properly? So there's lots of elements to this. There really are. Let's have a look. <laughs> I do like to read my comments. That would be the insulation lady calling this afternoon. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, and, and the thing is, it's also, um, I think what's interesting is, because we're talking about discovery calls, my expectation is that you've got somebody in front of you who's not necessarily cold. You have already warmed them up slightly. So that's kind of the principle and premise of a discovery call. But yes, the same principles apply, I believe, in cold calling, actually, Alison. So I think maybe the cold callers can learn from this presentation as well. But yes, we, we think we've communicated but the key is to check whether we really have, okay? And there's some other things I'm gonna talk about as well as we go through that, uh, back that up. We need to cement the need. So from the customer's perspective and not ours. So this is all about making sure, again, that we are just absolutely sure why the customer wants to buy, what the, pro the problem or challenge is that the customer has, therefore how we can then solve it. So it's important because often we're trying to sell what we think a customer needs. And this is the missing piece that can make such a difference. So the key, all those lovely life skills, ask great questions. 
Now, what I've tried to do here is I've created some generic questions, but then I've tried to connect a reason why, the raison d'etre for asking these questions and why this type of question is so powerful. But first of all, I want to ask you, have you heard of the five bare bums on a rugby post? Um, and this is really funny because somebody on LinkedIn the other day was talking about the five bums on the rugby post. And I said, well, actually, they have to be bare because otherwise they don't look like W's. But the whole principle of this, uh, this is definitely from old school selling, but it always makes me smile and it is memorable. So here are your open questions. And I'm sure most of the people in the room will have heard of open questions. But if you haven't, an open question is a question I cannot answer yes or no to. And that's the simplest way for me to explain it. But what the beauty of the open question is it creates a conversation. And that's what we want to do. We want to gather information and create a conversation. So when you look at these questions, every one of them, if you started a question with them, I couldn't say yes or no to them. Otherwise, I wouldn't make much sense. All right. So where did you go for your lunch today? Yes, it just doesn't make sense. But the point is then I'm able to elaborate. Well, actually we went to this wonderful restaurant. Do you know it? It's so-and-so, so-and-so. And it can create then the conversation. So your open questions are so important in a discovery call. I can't tell you um, any more than that. Because without these questions, you cannot gather the knowledge, you cannot stop objections and you cannot sell the right solution. So these are the starting point. So five bare bums on the rugby post. I'll be testing you guys to see. Oh, by the way, did you see the H is the, uh, the rugby post? So the how. A how question is always a good one. There's other slight versions of this that aren't necessarily questions. When you ask things like, tell me more about or describe. And those questions are wonderful because then you're really getting into the nitty gritty of how someone thinks. So remember to add those questions too. So let's just go through five questions that I've made, which are generic questions, and I've done them for a reason. So this first question is, how important is it to you to solve this challenge? And what this does is it creates whether this is a priority for them or not. And that's really important because now you're going to start to see what value they put on solving this challenge. All right. You see how we're stepping into the shoes of the customer and buyer here. The second question is what difference would what I offer make to your business? So this is really putting the emphasis on you as the seller, but it's getting your buyer to buy in to you. So you're finding out if it's really important that you're involved or whether they're just looking for a product so probably talking to 10 different people. It's a brave one potentially, but go for it because I think you need to sense check what value that person sees in you as the provider of that service. And I think that applies to product-based and service-based businesses. Number three. Here's a tell me more question. Tell me more about the impact this work stroke product will have for you. This is again establishing value. Now, uh, when I did the conference on Monday with the lovely people uh, who were all the opticians, we were talking about lots of fabulous specific questions for them. And when you think about guys in the audience, I wear my glasses. I'm sure there's some of you who are wearing glasses. I can see you are. We were talking about what hobbies do you have? So we could start saying, and what, what, what's a day look like in your life? You know, so that you can really start stepping into their world to see actually what they do every day. And how do you feel about wearing glasses? You know, and all these lovely questions start digging into my world. So if my optician was asking me those questions, I'd be really chuffed because I'd feel like they were really interested in me. And you can adapt these questions to anything that you do, any of you in the room. And that's the magic of great questions. So establish value. When you start to establish value, then objections become really difficult to make because you are heard and you are understood. 
The fourth question, this is a great question, I think, to establish perhaps how soon they might buy. So why is it important to change things now? The magic word is now, because that's an assumptive word and it's an assumptive question, but you will find out whether they have any urgency and what their commitment is to actually buying. So it might be that they might say, well, actually, I'm looking at the moment. I'm not sure I'm going to do it just yet. Brilliant, brilliant. And now you know. And now you can put them into a, a journey of nurture rather than that pushy sales piece. This is a lovely question. And then question number five, what happens if you don't do anything? So this is, a, again, it's a brave question, but it's a really, really relevant and valid question. And it challenges the motivation of your buyer. Are they prepared to do nothing? Oh, well, actually, I'll probably go another year and then I might look at it again in a year's time. That's not a motivated buyer. Well, actually, if I don't do something today, I might not have a business tomorrow. I know that's dramatic, but the point is that I'm just trying to give you that sort of uh, ends of the scale with this answer for this question. Can you see how powerful questions can be when you start to really think about what you want to ask and why you want to ask it? And I could do a whole session on questions, which who knows, maybe, maybe I will do that sometime. But questions are just an absolute art, but they are the difference between me being able to object and actually saying, oh my goodness, this is great. You just get me. And I really like you. I trust you now. And I think I'm going to buy from you because that's, that's how we are as humans. And don't forget the closed questions because our lovely closed questions, which are the questions that you can say yes or no to, are just as important, but they're much more important at the other end. Questions are the answers, Nikki's put. Questions are the answers. I like that. But closed questions are all about clarification and showing that you have understood what has been said to you. So if you don't use closed questions, what you've done is you've asked a load of absolutely marvelous questions and they've answered them, but because you didn't use the closed questions, they don't know you heard them and they don't know you understood them. So it's almost that repeating back. So what you're saying is also, oh, do you know what? Yeah, I had that once and story tell with it because that's what I tend to do rather than make it feel scripted. I'll say, do you know, I had that before, that happened to me. And then that makes that bond between you that you really have listened and you also have had that same experience. So yes, your closed questions are critical. And of course, if you ask questions, you need to be making sure you listen. And then again, there's a whole module on listening that we can talk about and there's a lot of fun around it. But let's face it, it's actually one of the hardest things to do thoroughly. Because often in a discovery call situation, we're thinking about what question we need to ask next. We're then thinking about how we're going to close the call. We then want to get off the call as soon as possible. We're then wondering what we're going to have for tea tomorrow night. And by that time, we haven't actually really listened to anything that we've talked to our customer about. So listening is really important. And I think the courage in listening is to be able to say, can you just explain that further so that I really understand what you're saying? Because often we think we can't ask again because they've said it, but clarify and listen and repeat back because that's the only way that your buyer will feel like you're listening to them and that you understand. And listening and understanding means no objections or less objections, I should say. And of course, building rapport, which somebody actually mentioned where they didn't really like it because perhaps didn't feel like any rapport had been built. And this is done in lots of ways through stories, through um, empathy. There's lots of ways to make you feel like I am building rapport. And actually building rapport for me is about caring, it means I care. And feel felt found is a very typical old school sales. Again, they did do some good 
little things that were memorable. And feel felt found is one of the ways that you can really build rapport because it's saying, I care, I understand. It's acknowledge the, acknowledging the hell in order to sell, as I say, but I understand how you feel and I felt that way too. But what I found was, so feel felt found is a really lovely way to take somebody through from understanding them to then giving them their solution. And that builds rapport with lovely empathy. So I like that one very much too. So remember to build your rapport as you're chatting and be you. That's obvious. But actually, sometimes when we're nervous and stressed on a discovery call, we're not being ourselves because we're so focused on what we've got to do next. And the reason I'll buy you is because you're you. Your UHP, as I mentioned in lots of my uh, presentations. Storytelling is also really important in discovery calls because it's another way for you to acknowledge you've heard, acknowledge you understand, and also to create that lovely human bond that doesn't feel scripted and the stories are yours. So Alison's on the call and I know I always pick on her, but Alison's an amazing storyteller. And when Alison's talking to us about products, she doesn't just say, this is great. It means that you'll get this result. She tells you about a customer who's used it and the situation they used it in and what happened. That's a wonderful story. And it's much more memorable because of the way that you've told it. And stories come in lots of different ways. So it could be patient stories. It could be customer stories. It could be your stories because you were once your customer. Often that's the case when you're in a service-based business. So use your stories and think about when you're doing your planning, if I'm going to try and uh, sell this particular product and I know the person coming has got this issue or challenge, what stories do you think I've got? What customers could I mention to this particular person? So storytelling. And of course, make connection because connection is the strongest thing that you can do in life and in sales and some of you know that this picture is this is me actually on a golf course and I was doing the 72 holes of golf for Macmillan challenge in one day so if any of you are golfers we did 72 holes in one day and this was all for my mum who I'd lost that year um, to cancer and this was just a moment in the day where we'd had hail, wind, sun, every single, it was like a washing cycle, basically. And we had a moment where the sun came out and somebody took this picture. And I think it's just amazing. And so I felt connection was the perfect word to put with it. So there's a story that goes with that picture. But when you connect with people, because they've been very natural, because they've had empathy, because they've listened and asked great questions, it's really difficult to even object to anything. Even if it is that you say, look, I'm not going to get this right now, but I'm coming back when I want it. That's a result. OK, so connection is really, really important. So the second part of our webinar, how to turn objections into powerful attraction points. I hope you can see that the things involved in that section are going to really stop people objecting. And if they have any objections at the end of all of you doing all of that, there will likely be really lovely objections as opposed to aggressive or scary objections. And it might be just a case of, I'm not going to buy it today, but I'm definitely coming back to see you. It could be anything like that. But the point is, you can reduce, if not stop altogether, objections by nurturing your customer through the discovery process. And third is how to beautifully close the call yet continue the conversation. So obviously you've done all of the lovely things that we've talked about so far. And really closing a discovery call is one of the things that most people get really scared about. Most people uh, jump off a call too quick and haven't really closed it at all. So it's almost been left dangling in the air <laughs> and nothing happened and nothing's going to happen. <laughs> So actually, you really need to think about what outcome you want, which would have been in your planning, because we've already done that bit. But then it's actually how do you carry that out during the call? So the first thing to do when you're starting to bring your call into a conclusion is to recap and clarify. 
And this is really important, as we mentioned before, because it shows then that I've completely understood what we've talked about. Here's what I think your issue or challenge is. And this is what I think is going to help you. Is that right, Mr. Customer? So that's setting you up then to be able to bring everything into a nice conclusion. The second thing then is to think about what is your call to action, all right? So what's the action that is going to be taken at the end of this discovery call? And remember at the beginning, we chose that list, didn't we, of possible outcomes, which is here again. So it might be that I'm gonna say, right, so I'm gonna connect you with my uh, business buddy, Joe Smith, because this conversation has been wonderful. I can't help you, but he can. That could be an outcome and that can be a call to action. I've taken an action. It could be that I connect you to uh, Mrs. Smith because she went through my program and had great results and she'd be very happy for you to speak to her. That's a call to action. It could be that I send you a proposal or it could be that we say, right, when do you wanna start? Okay, so those are all the different types of outcomes, probably at different levels even, but. A call to action is that you are going to do something. And that's really important because most people are telling me that when they leave a discovery call, they feel like frustrated, they didn't finalize what they wanted to do next, and they've just let the customer fly away. And I'll never see them again. So here's my lovely saying, and I think this is a really important one because it feels like I'm going to help you. It feels like I care. It also shows I'm in control. And whilst control can be seen as a little bit of a negative thing, as an expert in our fields, we should be the one who is in control. And so our clients and customers want to feel like that. They want to feel like we're leading the way. So what I'm going to do for you is, all right, it's a really great, great phrase. And it's very natural and it rolls off the tongue. And then you follow up with what it is you are going to do. So what I'm going to do for you is I am going to send you a proposal and I'm going to list out everything we've talked about today. And then I'm going to show you how we can work together to give you the solution you require. And I'm going to send that to you by Friday. OK, that's the other really important thing is when you're going to do it by or how long it will take. This is all about setting expectations. The next thing you do is you book in the next call during that discovery call, okay? So again, there's another action. If you want to make sure you continue the conversation, then the, one of the best ways is to say, so let's put in a call for a week's time and let's talk about where you're at then having had my proposal and see what you feel like doing there, okay? And they might cancel that call. But that doesn't matter right now. The fact is you are now making a preparation to continue that conversation, all right? They will potentially agree to that call because you're going to put it in the diary. So there's an element of commitment to this. If they say they don't want to book anything right now, then don't worry about that. Then make another commitment to say, I'm going to follow up in a week's time and just check in with you. That's another way of committing and meeting the expectations you're going to be in touch again. I often get asked by people, um, how long should I leave it in order to follow up? Um, and it's a very subjective question and I don't think there's a right or wrong answer. But when you do this bit, so you set an expectation, well, I'm going to call you in a week, then they expect that's when they're going to hear from you next. So it makes it a lot easier to do that follow up. And do what you said you do by the date you said you do it. <laughs> because, you know, whilst I laugh, um, this is actually really serious. Because if somebody's promised they're going to send you something and you don't get it, it can really destroy everything you may have built on a discovery call. So it's very, very important because it's another thing, an area where you build trust. So that is how to beautifully close the call and yet continue the conversation. So just a few things there in order for you to be able to feel comfortable with your discovery calls. Final thoughts. So here's an acronym. I love my acronyms. 
this is what I believe we should do. We should not be selling to our customers, but we should be loving them. And that's all to do with the fact that we do love them because we care about them. We do look at the opportunities that are right for them as well as us. We do make sure we understand what they think value is as well as what we think value is. And we work with integrity. We also nurture our sales. If a sale needs to take 12 months, please let it take 12 months because there will be sales that happen immediately on the day and always come from a place of giving, expecting nothing in return. And that's a bit of a Simon Sinek moment as well there because he said that too. And I do think that the big thing that's behind a lot of our sales hang-ups, including discovery calls, is the fear, the fear that we feel, which is often internal and often because we haven't got a structure or a plan. And Taylor Swift said, fearless is not the absence of fear. Fearless is actually living in spite of those things that scare us. So be fearless about your discovery calls, guys. That's, that's really important. So what would it mean to you if you were able to feel calm and confident in your discovery calls and stop objections before they even start? End your calls with a successful next step and be supported by a like-minded community of entrepreneurs. I do have with us tonight some of the members of our Sales Academy, but I would like to just extend out to the people at this webinar and as a thank you for coming and joining me that the conversation can continue because my membership is set out beautifully as a high street, a high street of shops, and each shop represents a place where you can connect, learn, and belong. And this is based on my, my beautiful dad because I grew up watching him serve his customers in the sweet shop, which a lot of you will know. But the high street makes it special for me because of how it's themed. But every single part that High Street has videos on tap for you of how you can learn everything about sales, community, a coffee shop community, and also live events every week where we not only listen to my dulcet tones, but also we have guest experts come in and member sessions too. So you can show off as members. And ordinarily, it would be £47 a month to be a monthly member of this fabulous membership. But you have a special offer to join by UK Midnight this Friday, which is actually a £35 a month uh, membership. And this is a price for life. So I would love you to come and join our membership. And it is a monthly, so you can join for as long as you want to. But the people in here who are already members, I think are enjoying it or so they tell me they are. So it would be lovely to have some more of you in there. Plus, if you do book, at that wonderful offer, you get a complimentary 30 minute coaching session with me. So and those 30 minute express sessions, I tell you, we get some stuff done. They're pretty amazing. They really are. So remember that your offer is by the end of Friday. So midnight UK by Friday. And I've got some comments in here, some shout outs, super value, Eleanor says. And Alison says, it is one of the best groups and support I belong to. And Jules has not paid me for saying that. No, I didn't actually. I really, really didn't pay her for that. So, um, so before you go, I would really, really like to be able to offer you the opportunity to ask me any questions, if you have any. I'm going to put us back onto gallery view. And please feel free to unmute say hello and ask any questions if you have any about discovery calls. Any questions? Does that mean? Just, uh, yeah, just a thank you because I tend to bowl into calls and you just need reminding, you know, plan it, think it through, think about how I'm going to finish it and just be a bit more thoughtful and every now and then you just need to be come on Alison you know be more professional so that was brilliant thank you Jules oh, thank yeah. you Alison yeah it I'd like yeah exactly the same I'd I just need to step back and plan and think about the structure of my call and um yeah and build that rapport and hopefully 
um, I get a presentation or an appointment at the end of it, mm. <laughs> which is the most important thing for me. Yeah, it is. It is important, Nick. It's important for all of us that we make those connections and make the sales, you know, but I think it feels so much nicer when it feels like it's genuine and it feels yeah. like it was a little bit easier than perhaps we thought it should have been. So, you know, that is really, really nice. Yeah. So, yeah, thank you for that. Um, can I just ask, is there sort of an ideal length for a discovery call? Yeah, that's a really good question, Jackie. Um, on my discovery calls are 30 minutes. And um, I tell you why that works well for me. Probably, well, possibly because I'm, I've done so many discovery calls. So I know how I like to ask my questions. And I think it feels for the person in that call, like you've given them some time. If ever I see a discovery call that says 15 minutes, I often think it's going to be a bit of a rush and I feel like I might be restricted where if it's, if it's 30 minutes, somehow psychologically, I feel like, oh, we've got a bit of time to chat, haven't we? You know, yeah. you, could, you could have a cup of coffee in 30 minutes, couldn't you? So I, I really like that. And then I think um, the other thing to say is that if it's longer, Jackie, you might get into the realms of giving away paid uh, content that you didn't really want to do, you know, so because you've got longer to almost help the person. Because that's the other thing mm -hmm. to hold back, really. It's only a discovery call. It's not actually a coaching or a, or a service session. Mm -hmm. So I'd say 30 minutes is a good, good time period. Sounds right. Thank you. Thank you. May I ask um, if you have any suggestions on a different name for it? I think discovery call sounds really corporate -y and I want yeah. something kind of softer. Mm -hmm. yeah. It does kind of say this is a chat, no obligation sort of, but I haven't kind of thought of anything. <laughs> so mine, mine's a virtual cuppa, Caroline. That's what I call mine. Um, <laughs> you're very welcome to pinch it because I probably heard it somewhere else and I copied it too. But for me, a virtual cuppa feels much more friendly. Um, it's virtual, obviously, because we're on Zoom, so they don't think I'm going to turn up on their doorstep. Um, and it just feels nice. Yeah, like you say, it doesn't feel like I'm going to pushy, be pushy and, and push a sale. So, yeah, yeah. so I call it a virtual cuppa. I just call it a Zoom call. <laughs> 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 yeah, um, my, my, my calls are usually they they are warm leads they are very warm leads already and i well i fail so the questions is really great your, your questions i have made a note of that because it's all about the the other person it's all about the potential clients so all my calls are all about them but and asking the questions that letting them say it make it so much more valuable than me telling them oh yeah. this and that and Mm -hmm. I do have a questionnaire before I go into the call, so I have already uh, lots of things sorted, mm -hmm. sorted out and can go more in the depths. Half an hour would never work. Uh, I'm glad when I get it in an hour because I might be waffling at some point. <laughs> One of the things I would do with the questionnaire is I would look at the questionnaire, the, the questions on it. When you get those answers back, I would make sure that that, that person in the call knows you've absolutely read those answers and refer back to them. So it really yeah. feels like you have taken yeah, those I, on board. You may well do that already, but you know, that, yeah. questionnaires mm. are great to have. And some people don't even refer back to them or, or even, I don't know, acknowledge that that person's taken the time to fill them out. So that's very powerful if you can do that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I have them always in front of me and go and different yeah. things because it's about, from, from, from my business, all about their business. Yeah, yeah. because. I cannot do my job when I don't know their business. So yeah, because you're, you're a photography, aren't you? Kim? Yeah, brand photography. Oh, yeah. So naturally, I, I I'll, I'll dig into their business because that's what I want them to see that they see that I want to that I get them and that I understand mm -hmm. and want to understand what I do. I, I fail in the end usually when they say yes, let's do that, and um, we pick a date, and then. They agree to everything and then I don't take the deposit of them. And then I say, okay, I'll send you a quote in the contract and then you can pay me the deposit. And then they start talking to other people. And then, oh, really? Is that much you want to invest in brand photography? And then they come back, oh, well, I got second thoughts. And, and they wouldn't well, be think, doing 
I think the other thing about this is that, you know, and I've said this again lots of times, is that you will never sell to everyone. And I think if oh, yeah, you've got, that. you know, and, and sometimes people are just going to do that and, and that's okay. But if you think if you've done all the things you can do in this, in that journey, then you're more likely to get the sale from the right people who share those same values and, and see the value in you. You are more likely to do that. That's that's an absolute promise. It really is because I've done this for so long and I know that there will be, you'll know, you almost know in your gut, I think the people who are going to be the people who will come and work with you. It's really interesting. So yeah, yeah I, had, I had a couple where I was really, I, I felt it and I thought this is this is ideal client this is perfect and then it sorry I'm it, just waving to Mohammed oh, because he's just leaving sorry, sorry carry on yeah I had I had I had I think one that really really bothered me because I I thought because I thought this is ideal client this is all all worked so fine yeah and it, it was just perfect and then and then three days later, oh, I talked to my daughter and they think I'm not ready yet. And bang, they were gone. And I thought, what? <laughs> so, so that was one that we we're thinking, oh, I really need to think about kind of nailing it down at the end of the call when they are in all excitement. Um, but, also, but also, I think there's a fine, fine balance between them becoming pushy. Um, and actually then just allowing people to come back when they're ready and I, and that's why I talk about nurture because I think yeah, it's really really important I had a lady come in lockdown to work with me she had followed me for two years I d I'm not even joking with you two years she had followed me and then she suddenly came and then she just she'd chosen me I didn't have to do anything she had chosen me but that lead time to sale was two years when you look at it so I think it's just about being out there, being visible, doing these calls, having these conversations and just learning more and more about these ideal customers and what they truly want from you and what you can give them as a solution. So, Michael, it's lovely to see yeah, you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Another for one, uh, Kirsten, <laughs> just a, another one when you say, right, you know, the daughter or somebody else is, is there anybody else that's going to help you make this decision? Is another question because it could be a boss, it could be family. Yeah. Um, in our case, it's always, you know, yeah, there's always, you know, other, yeah, other the decision there that are going to them. Yeah. Yeah. Is there anybody else that will be helping you make your decision yeah. before you decide to, you know, move ahead yeah. with this? Yeah. Is always a good question to ask. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I, I think I think just this one was really giving me a yeah. book yeah. where yeah. I thought that was really I mm. said, oh my god, this is wonderful. And then <laughs> so it was oh, yeah no and and yeah they were not my client because otherwise that would not have happened yeah mm. exactly that exactly that oh uh, thank you for your input it's really nice to just have this discussion at the end and Fatima lovely to see you as well really nice to see you so listen I hope you've enjoyed that if there's any more questions please just just connect and message me Sarah you you've got something I can't hear you I can't hear you I've got no audio I don't know why I thought I could see, no, I got, no, can't hear you at all. Mm. Type it in, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you want to type it in now or do you want to send, yeah, type it in the comments if it's not too long because we'll answer it for you. So, yeah, so it's um, if, if any of you have got any questions after this, just message me with them because it would be lovely to, to help you. And I know I'm catching up with a few of you on here as well. So let's have a look. Sarah says, should you get involved in pricing and discovery call? <clears throat> Sarah, I think that's about how comfortable you feel in that call, if I'm honest with you. But I would never get involved with price until it's right at the very end when you've made sure you've built all of that value, you've understood exactly what they want, you've got clarity back and confirmation that it is what they want. Because the more they get to say, yes, that's it, yes, that's right, yes, that will help. When you deliver a price, it's much harder for them to object to it but equally, you know, one of your questions could be, what investment are you looking to make in this? Because that's really important. And don't use budget, just use investment. It's a much better word because we understand that better. So, so hopefully that's helpful. Okay, guys, so thank you so thank much. You. It's lovely to see you. And I will see you all again soon. Next month, we're running a challenge, not a webinar. So if you're in the Sales Hub group on Facebook, then you'll be able to see all about that on there as well. So do join us. Thank you. See you all soon.